our presentation ceremony. And we are going to have the speech by Professor Edward Howey. It is our great honor that you are able to uh, make a presentation in our uh, uh, conference as at the Norway of the award, yeah. And I will make you the uh, co-host, uh, yes, of uh, this session. Yeah, you can now start sharing your presentation file of Professor Howie. Yeah, it is our great honor. Okay. And yeah, and as said, our second objective is to have the video recording for this presentation so that it will become part of our open access uh, nature's video series. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for the award. I'm honored and I'm very happy to meet you and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Up. Okay. Much. I'm sorry to start late. I won't speak very long. I would just like to tell you a little bit from my field, which is NLP. And what has happened, because as you know, ChatGPT has just come in November 1st, and it has changed many, many things in our field. So uh, there are a lot of people quite scared. Many students say, I don't know what to study anymore. My whole field is upside down. So I made this talk as a beginning to understand what is happening. Where did we come from in NLP? Why are we here now? And where can we go? So that is the, the theme. So here's a map of NLP for those people who don't know NLP very well. In the beginning of NLP, the oldest thing was machine translation. People started in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Pretty soon came information retrieval. Today we call it Google. Speech recognition. Today you speak to Amazon, to Alexa, et cetera. You speak to the system. Then came dialogue processing, multi-speech, multi-sentences together. Then came on the different side, information extraction. You take a text, you pull small pieces of information out of the text, you put it in a database or somewhere. Question answering was sort of in the middle of information retrieval and information extraction and text summarization, take a long text, make it short. They all made kind of a little family there. And then came text mining. You have a lot of text. You want to take some things and find some, a little bit like data analytics, some temp some tendencies and trends in the text. And then most recently came in-depth reading where you take a text, you do not take many texts, you take one text and you must try to understand automatically as much as you can from that one text. So these are some of the major applications of NLP. They're kind of like one box, that's all the applications. But of course there are subtasks you must do. So word sense disambiguation, you must understand one word can have multiple meanings. Co-reference, you can say he and it and they, you must understand which ones those words mean. Sentiment is something good or bad. Entailment, what is logically following from what, etc. These are like the small ones, some of the small ones inside the big ones. But that's not all, of course. There's to do the work, you have to take a sentence and understand the structure of the sentence. You must take the semantic pieces of the sentence and give them their roles. You must understand how sentences connect to one another and make the paragraph structure. You must generate, produce the sentence from the internal structure, make output. You must plan the text if you have multiple sentences, which comes first, etc. These are all sort of sub-steps to do any of the other ones. You must break up a word into little pieces. You must do part of speech. You must say which is a noun and a verb. You must do named entity. You must recognize the names of things. All of these are building blocks, basic operations. But still, that is not all. Underneath, you have the basic techniques, finite state machines, hidden Markov models, which is like a finite state machine, but he learns the transition weights automatically, graphical models, neural networks, vector spaces, clustering, alignment, many kinds of machine learning. These are generic techniques, which many kinds of AI and other techniques use. Of course, NLP uses them as building blocks. That's still not all. You have to measure the progress, the quality. So evaluation, all the metrics and techniques is a big field. That's a separate part. And still there's more. There are the toolkits, sometimes for evaluation tools, sometimes for the techniques, sometimes for different things. 
there are many, 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 many evaluate uh, little toolkits, tools that you can download from the web. I just list some. And then, of course, there are the data preparation. So how you make the data, how you have humans annotate the data, that's a whole line of work. Then you have the data itself. Is it corpora you build? Is it large language models, lexicons, grammars, etc.? All this is the resources you have. And finally, to finish the picture, is the underlying theory. There's linguistics, the syntax, there's semantics, the meaning, there is pragmatics, the interpersonal situational kind of meaning, there's information theory from Shannon, all of these together are the theories. This is kind of a roadmap, a map of all the pieces of NLP as far as I can understand it and put it in one picture. Many of my colleagues, they fight with me. They don't like this picture, but I think it is a picture. I have not seen another picture that is trying to do the same as much as this one. So if it's good or if it's bad, it is at least trying to put everything in the different places and show their relationships. That's where we came from. Today, six months ago, November 1st, OpenAI announced ChatGPT, and then Google announced BARD, and then Microsoft bought Sydney, and suddenly a lot of this work is finished. It's not relevant. ChatGPT and the others, they can do many, many, many of these things automatically. They were not trained to do them. They were, there was no special purpose algorithms or machine learning to do them. They can just do them. That is a big shock to NLP people who have spent 30 or 40 or 50 years working on these little pieces. The question is, what must we do now? What must we do now that the, the, our feet are pulled away from under us? How did we get here? So I would like to show four or five little lessons. What happened at some points in the history and why did we come to this point? Number one, in 2001, this paper, by Banco and Gabriel was kind of an interesting paper. It said, I'm going to do some very simple things. I want to build a machine that can learn. When must I say your or your? When must I say two with one O or two with two O's or two T-W-O? When must I say it's or when must I say it's with the apostrophe S? Now, obviously, if you look at the words left and right, you can very easily see what to do. And so there are five algorithms they took an n-gram table, just left and right words, or winnow, or a perceptron, a simple neural net, or some transformation-based learning or decision tree learning. And they tried the following experiment. First, they trained with 1 million words, then with 10 million words, then with 100 million words, then with 10 to the 9 words. And if you look at the graph, you see what happens. When you start on the left side with just 1 million word training data, there's a lot of difference between the algorithms. But when you go to the right, the algorithms come together and they come closer and closer to the, to the top, they asymptote. And sometimes an algorithm that was very good before is not so good anymore. And sometimes one that is very bad before is good. The lesson here is you don't have to worry about optimizing and try to make the best machine learning algorithm because if you have enough training data, even a stupid algorithm will get there. You don't have to be clever. You just need enough training data. Let's look at lesson number two. The best machine translation system in the world at the time there was built by Franz Och. He was in my group at ISI, and then he went to Google. They paid him three times the salary, and he built the Google machine translation engine. And he told me, look, I don't care about syntax and semantics and rules and anything. I just learn little word patterns. I learn little patterns of, say, Arabic word, word one, word two, word three, word four, word five. And I learn is this, what is the sister pattern in English, word two, word one, word two, and word two is the same as Arabic word two and three together, and word three and is the same as word four in Arabic, and English word four is the same as word five in Arabic. And so I learned that's the translation pattern. I don't care if it's a syntax rule or not a syntax rule. I just learn a pattern. He says, all I need is enough patterns. I need not just bigram two-word patterns or three-word patterns. I just need four, five, six words as long as I have. If you give me all the multi-word sequences of the whole language and you give me a, a table 
for all the, uh, this, the other language, I will do perfect translation for you. No, no cleverness, no thought, no anything, just a big table and clever, quick algorithms. That's what he did. And he won for a long time. Google Translate was the best translation engine, even using this stupid algorithm. So you don't have to be clever. You just need enough storage. Next thing, I look at my colleague Kevin Knight and David Chang, and they wrote a paper where they said, also for machine translation, we use features. We build syntax trees, and then we look at the features, and we learn machine learning on the features, which word is above which word, and which word is to the left of which word, and which word has a plural, and blah, 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 all kind of thing. And they built 10,000 context features, and they won a prize at the NACL conference 2009, the best paper award. They thought it's great. I thought it was terrible. If you have 10,000 features, you don't know what's going on. You just try to remember all the features. So they said, if you have enough features, you can win. You can make the best game there. And that's OK. So their lesson is you don't have to be smart. You just need enough features. And then your engine will work. Now we go to BERT. 2018, the Google guys, they build BERT and they make it available and they try on 11 standard NLP tasks like inference and named entity recognition and question answering and generation. And they show that this big, large language model with so many little engrams inside, he can do better at most of these tasks, better than the specialized algorithms that people have spent years building before. They just go better. And many people got depressed and said, what, you just need one big, large language model and you can do all that stuff? And BERT says, yes, you don't have to be smart. You can do most things with BERT, with a large language model. Now, of course, you know where I'm going next, right? The next slide has to be ChatGPT. In November 1 of last year, OpenAI announced ChatGPT. Before that, they had built GPT-2, GPT-3. They take a very large language model and they put the chat loop on top. I will show in a second the chat loop. And so you can put English in, English out. You don't have to learn to program or anything. You don't need to know anything about machine learning. You just put a prompt in and the machine will give you a prompt out based on the knowledge which is pre-compiled, learned into that big engine. Even it can do software programming. And that thing can do amazing stuff, amazing. You don't have to do any work anymore. You can do everything with ChatGPT. You look at this in my field and you start to cry. You say, what must I do with my life? This thing can do everything. All my work on Parser and part of Speech Tagger and QA Engine, all the things I showed on the first slides is gone. We don't need parsing or grammars. We don't need text planning or discourse structure or, or language generators. We don't need co-reference and word sense disambiguation and stuff. We don't need MT and QA and sentiment detection. This one machine can do everything and it did not even learn to do it. It was not trained to do it. What can we do, right? That's the question. So it is a scary time for many people in our field, also for my students, because you have to redefine, you have to look very carefully what can I do that this engine cannot do? Where is my value? Now, to understand where, you have to go back and look at what is NLP. I think the best way to think of NLP is it's a transformation of notation. If you say, I give you an English sentence, and I get back a Chinese sentence that's called machine translation, that's just changing the notation. If you say I give you an English string and I come out with a parse tree or a case frame, a different structure, that's just changing the, trans the transforming the notation. If you say I give you a case frame in and out you come with a string, that's called language generation. Sound waves to a text string, that's called speech recognition. Long text to shortcuts is called summarization, right? Sometimes you add a little bit more information, like part of speech tags and labels and things like this, or brackets. Sometimes you write a little bit of a theory, you make a notation, a model, or something like this. But mostly NLP has become engineering. You just take a data set, you build a simple model, and you just apply machine learning tricks and so on until so, you get the best transformer, the thing that learns the notation transformation best. So you can look at it this way, where you say, at the bottom, I get English in and English out. It's direct replacement from a long text to a short text, 
or from something to something straight. But I can do a little bit of work into some kind of abstract space and I have set, set my symbol set and then I can do a quicker translation, a quicker transformation and then do a little bit of work to go back to the source. And I, the layers, the more and more abstraction I do, the higher, more abstract representation space I go into and the more work I must do to go up and the more work I must do to go down. But the theory is, and for machine translation, this is called the Vauquois triangle. The theory is if I get to the real deep understanding, then I don't have to worry about one word to one word translation. I can get to the deep understanding and go back again to the deep um, generation from the deep understanding. And this I can do for QA and summarization and many applications. That was the old days, right? But now suddenly we have this one machine, ChatGPT, a complex, very large, large language model, and he can do all of that stuff from English in to English out. And I don't know what he's doing inside. Nobody, not even OpenAI, can tell you what is he doing inside. Nobody knows. The generative loop on top of a large language model, which is the knowledge a sort of n-gram word model, can do most of NLP. So we have to ask, what is inside that thing? What can they not do in principle? And what research must we do now, if any? Right? Those are the burning questions that we have to ask now. So first, let's look what's inside of a large language model. I give you hundreds of millions of sentences, and each word is encoded as a little vector called an embedding, a vector of real numbers. Right? I hide some of those words, and I say to the machine, machine, you learn to fill in those words again. So here is a simple machine with two layers, and then the top layer is a classifier layer, the green walls, and I give it a sentence. He ran up the steps to the platform and managed to get onto the. And you must predict what word will you fit there? The answer is train. Or he ran up the steps to the something and managed to get onto the train. What word must fit in there? You know, as a human, it's not airplane, it's not banana, it's not chocolate, it's not shoes. It must be platform in that space. Here's the third sentence. He ran up the <clears throat> to the platform and managed to get onto the train. What can you run up to? It's not he ran up the tree. He ran up the ideas. It's got to be something like steps, right? If I give you hundreds of millions of sentences and you can look at left and right context, you begin to pick up the combinations of words or the features of those words, like moving type words or sitting type words or date type words, so that you can predict what goes left and right. That is all. That is exactly and only the knowledge that is in a large language model like this. Right? The way you get you to train it is you, you, you give the sentence the first sentence in, it makes a guess. If it's a wrong guess, you make the scores go lower, the scores on the arrows. If it's a right guess, you make the scores on the, the arrows go higher and all the way down. That's called back propagation. You do this hundreds of millions of times, and then you get the engine. And it is a surprise that these engines do well, but they do do well. So now you say, really? A large language model like this is a word feature n-gram model. It's just a model of a set of words, a, a, little, a little string of words, or not really words, the word features. Things like it's a date word here, a location word, and things. Micro features, you can call them, in a 500-unit context of every English word. And so all you need to know is that stuff. And that's the big language model. So almost Every imaginable microfeature you can imagine is in there. If you are interested in all the words that begin with a T, or if you are interested in all the words that are five letters long, or if you are interested in all the date kind of words, or whatever, it's in there somehow. You must just tell the machine, you've got everything in there, and now in the final stage of training, I want you to tell me dates. Or I want you to tell me five-letter words. Or I want you to tell me something. You train him a little bit and he learns what you want. And at the end, he gives you what you want. And then you write the prompt and you get it. Right? So you can think of a large language model as a big table, almost like a big spreadsheet. And, and he has got millions of rows and all the rows contain the information. And on the next column, he's giving you the answer of just the little gap there. 
So it's a big multi-dimensional table of English with all these micro features in there. You give it some micro features and it will give you the matching other one. If you give this thing, when was the Panama Canal built? That word says, I want a date kind of feature somewhere. Well, the word I must generate must have a date information. Panama Canal, the, the words you generate must somehow be connected close to Panama Canal. Build, the word you give me must have something to do with building. Any date-ish thing that comes close to Panama Canal and close to build anything in the history that you have read, that's the answer. Right? It's not so difficult when you think about it. Another question. Wood is to carpenter, so there's the material, to the worker, is the same as stone is to what? Who is the worker of stone? Well, I have a material. I have the worker. I have a, a connection. I have another material. I want its worker with that same connection, right? You give me that stuff. You give me that combination of micro features. I will look for a word in all my history, all my reading that has that connection to all of these other things, the micro feature combination there. That's how it works. Okay. So to make it work inside each neuron, you have to have a little function that maps the features correctly. So if you look at a little thing like this, you say, I have three features, red, yellow, and blue on the input. And if it's a straight line function, I have three on the output equal size. That linear function doesn't work. If you put a nonlinear function like tan h they often use or sigmoid or something, then when I give in equal red, yellow, blue, after the training, yellow becomes very big and blue becomes very small. My back propagation is telling me, hey, I don't like blue. Squash everything blue, but I do like yellow. Give a lot of representation space to yellow. Every small change in the vector numbers of yellow means a big possible change on the output side. And you do this through the backpropagation many times, and then you can learn which micro features are important and which are not. So I can go from something where I have on the input side some spelling information, morphology information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And on the output side, I can say, I don't care about spelling, but I do care about the yellow one, semantic type, etc. Right? That's what you do. So now I have this knowledge base, this large language model. Now I want him to work for me, to speak. How can I do that? Well, OpenAI did a clever thing. They took a hundred, a big piece of the English web, 175 word feature combinations. They took about five years. As far as I can find out, it cost about 100 million US dollars with specialized hardware from Microsoft. And they built this very big language model, GPT-3. And then later they trained it with human training to do GPT, uh, chat GPT. Now they put the loop on top. They say, when you throw a question in, like here is a question, you look at the words in the question and you say, please, language model, give me all the little phrases, all the little sentences that contain those words in the context somewhere. So you get a lot of them. Okay. So here are some possibilities. Let's pick one. We like that one. And that is a good one to start. Okay, now we say, I've got that one. Let me now take some more words from there and let me look for new phrases that contain those words that continue the sentence. You know, I've got some new, con new possibilities. Let me pick that one. So I go from left to right, step by step. I just extend the, my word window and I get more and more and more sentences coming up. That's exactly what this thing does. It doesn't have some logic. It doesn't have some reasoning. It doesn't have some coherence. It just goes left to right. That is what OpenAI says. That is what it says when you ask ChatGPT how you work. I don't quite believe it. I think there is something more going on, but you don't hear that or you cannot read what they, what they do. They hide something. But basically, I think you can believe that the machine doesn't really know anything. It just has a lot of these word combinations, and it just knows how to pick some and continue putting them together. So if there is logic, you are lucky that there's logic because it's from the long context, the, the set of sentences that string together. There's no bigger logic, no deeper reasoning, nothing like that. So you can easily make it go into a stupid place. If you keep talking about the earth is flat, the earth is flat, the earth is flat, 
it will find its knowledge in its knowledge that it has read all the texts where people talk about the earth is flat and it will start say, telling you the earth is flat the earth is flat and it will give you all kind of reasoning based on your pushing it into that corner of the space where the text it's drawing from is flat earth right so there's no logic here there's no understanding of truth there's just this set of facts that uh, things that it has read and you can push it into any space right so you cannot really trust it you cannot use it to tell you the truth as google noticed when they introduced bard they asked it some questions it made a wrong statement in some of the questions it said something wrong in five hours google lost over a hundred billion dollars in sh sh shares because people said this thing doesn't work right <laughs> it's an important thing it also has a lot of problems of bias. It doesn't know what is biased and unbiased. It just knows what the, the stuff it read. So it is good to give you the first draft, the first ideas, just the beginning, but it is not good to give you anything more. It's a lot of fun to play with, but as a human, you have to go read carefully to make sure it is complete and more and all that stuff. So we begin to see that there are gaps. There is space for research now. But we have to carefully look, where is the research opportunities for us? Where do we go from here? Let's look. I think we have evolved over 60 years of NLP, three kinds of work. Some people care about algorithms. They like to understand how I transform, transform information from one to the other. Some people care about language. They say, yeah, you can do the algorithms, but I want to understand how language works. What is communication? When do I make a picture? How do I convince you? What is a feeling, emotion, a style? And some people care. I don't care about that. I don't care. I want to make money. I want to make a big engine. They care about applications. Typically, they are the people in the big companies. There are these three kinds of people, and sometimes the same kind of person does three kinds of work, right? So now... From this, what happens in the new context with ChatGPT? How, how do we, we NLP researchers, how do we find a home for ourselves and for the work we love to do? Well, one kind of work is just to build smaller and cheaper LLMs. Clearly, we need to do that. Another kind of work is to say, well, LLMs are broken inside. They can lie to me. Me, they don't know everything. They cannot explain themselves. I need to build algorithms to fix that. And other kind of people say, well, you know, they cannot do arithmetic. They cannot do reasoning and logic. It's not just that they're broken in their language ability. They just cannot do everything. I want to do more. So that's adding new external capabilities in the work of communication. So the first is sort of like engineering work. The second group is sort of like algorithms work. And the third is sort of like linguistic communication theoretical work, if you want to say it that way. So let's look at each of these, and then we're finished, okay? The first one, <clears throat> it's not good for the world if this generative LLMs, things like ChatGPT, are only in the hands of three or four companies, right? If it's just OpenAI and Google and Microsoft and, I don't know, Alibaba or somebody, that is not good because we need to be able to investigate the problems and fix them. The world needs more freedom of research than just these big companies controlling everything. That's not a healthy situation. So I think a lot of people are already working to make smaller LLMs, not full everything that know everything about everything, but that are more tailored to specific things, maybe a bit lower quality, but things that are the size of a university project, $5 million, 18 months and that they start with older LLMs like BERT and their specialized training to make new ones. I think that's gonna be very popular work in the future. That's the engineering work. And I think soon we will have these kinds of things before the end of the decade, before 2028, we will have a lot of LLMs and lots of people will have their own LLMs and they'll be better and worse and there'll be competitions and things like this. We're going to see that happening. And this is good, but I don't think this is a job for a research student. I don't tell my students to do this because I think this is what the companies can do. This is what they're good at. So let them do it. Small companies who want to fight with Google. Great. The algorithm people, here the challenge is clear, right? We don't know how to make the best prompt 
for ChatGPT. You know, if you change your prompt a little bit, it makes a different answer. How can you do prompt learning, prompt optimization? You need to have a score. You need to have something you optimize towards. You can say, this is a good answer. This is a bad answer. This is a better answer. You need a metric in that space. We don't have that, right? But if we do, we can do prompt learning, right? That's one thing. Another thing is explanation. You cannot tell ChatGPT, tell me why you said this. It cannot say. It cannot answer that. It just composed the words together, right? So maybe one can find a history of how it was trained, where the training data came from, and how it was combined and why it was combined. So that's some research. I know some people, one of my, some of my students who are now working in Google and other places, that's what they're working on. Show me the data, your training data. Show me how you compose them. Other people say these things are biased. They think everybody looks like the majority and stuff like this. So how can we remove the bias? That's another big research problem. There's a lot of current work on this already. <laughs> there will be more. And I think this is where most of the NLP energy is going to go. This is typical community ACL type work with data preparation and training and testing methodology and stuff. That's great. A lot of people will do that. To me, though, the interesting one is the third one. It's saying these LLMs cannot do more than their data, which is linguistic language or maybe images, gives them, right? So if you stop your training data in 2019, like OpenAI did, then there is nothing after 2019. It doesn't exist, right? But we know it's more. So how can you update a language model without destroying things from before? Or maybe the data is wrong. There are pieces of the data where people believe the earth is flat or there were no dinosaurs, it's just a dream or something like that. If you push the engine in the right way, you get to those pieces. But we know that's stupid, right? So how can we actually fix that? How can we make the training data understand when things are wrong or sure or somewhat sure, we don't know, right? How can we put that into the engine? Or well, the data is biased. Or the data is only language. <clears throat> it cannot know about feelings, about emotions, about being hungry or sleepy. All it can know is the words about those things, but not really what it means. Can you build representations to do that? Can you build a different kind of representation and put it into the same space to treat a language, a large language model to be no longer just a language model, but a true foundation model? Now, OpenAI understood that this is a challenge for them. <clears throat> they People already can start do building arithmetic. Wolfram Alpha is this program that's been going for a long time that can do physics reasoning and stuff like this. So OpenAI makes like an app store for ChatGPT. So they call what a plugin. You can build your own little plugin thing. You can teach ChatGPT when it must recognize that your app is relevant, and then it must push the information from anybody who's using it into your app. Your app will run, and the information will come out. And then ChatGPT will give the right answer from your app, right? That's what the plugins there. Very interesting to do that. It is OpenAI's attempt. They are trying to block small LLMs to come out. They want to be the one big LLM that captures everything like one big app store from Apple, right? Separately, you can have knowledge representation embedding for other modes of knowledge like images and emotions and stuff. So there's a lot of work to do here, a lot of really interesting work. Do we need one big LLM that can do everything or a bunch of small little apps around one big one or a bunch of small LLMs that speak to one another? Nobody knows, right? Very interesting question. So I believe what's going to happen is NLP, this part of NLP, will broaden out and connect to other fields like sociology, image processing, reasoning and logic, psychology, etc., there will be closer interactions with other people. We will try to get their knowledge and systematize it and get their reasoning and put it in such a way that it can fit into things like LLMs. And we will explore how the representations can be built for them. And we will, of course, have to make new kinds of data sets and evaluations and stuff. I think this is really very, very interesting work. And now we can use ChatGPT just as an engine, as a tool, as like a programming tool just a more sophisticated thing instead of using Java, right? You program English in, program English out, but then you use that stuff and you put other things on top and around of it. Now, there's always a third 
a little bit of another problem, right? There's always the evaluation problem. So that's like the, the half future. Always people will need evaluations. We cannot measure or evaluate the output of chat GPT today. There's nobody knows how to measure it, right? So that's something that needs to be done. And there's a lot of work that should be done on this. Now, evaluating is very, very difficult. It's more difficult than almost any other kind of research because you have to prove that your metric is correct. And it's not clear what correct means except people like it, right? So you have to do all kinds of tests when you propose a metric and you have to build a metric and test against people and show consistency and edge conditions and things. It's actually very difficult to do. Right. So especially in this case, because here you have to measure the content. Is the thing correct? Is it lying to me? Did it say everything it must say? And you must measure style. Did it say it properly? Did it say it in the right style for me? Was it coherent? Was it well organized, etc.? This is this is complicated. This is lots of little pieces that have to be done here. So ultimately, I think you get to the following picture, which is a nice picture at the top. You have to find out what's missing in these large language models, identify them, and then understand them, maybe make corpora and annotate them, fix them somehow. Then you must come to the algorithms people and they say, okay, now build the algorithms, fix uh, the, the generative LLM type loop or something so that it can do bias, that it can do correctness, it can do reasoning. When they can do that, give it to the guys who build small LLMs and see if they can make a small one do all of that stuff. And when they say, oh, no, I cannot do this, here's a problem, I cannot do something, go back to the first group and say, okay, first group, figure out how we need special knowledge to do something. So the top, in the middle, you measure everything, right? So the top people are, are people like NLP people who work with these others. The algorithms people are most of the current NLP hacker types. And the left guys are the ones, mostly the company engineers. And in this world, I think each one influences the other, but it's a very stable, good cycle of research that we can work together to take this new wonderful tool called large language models and figure out how to make it better so it can serve all of us. The main question for us researchers is, which one am I? Where do I fit? That's an interesting question in today's world. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks a lot for Professor Hovey's uh, uh, speech. It is our great honor and to have the speech as well as do our award presentation ceremony. As said, our, uh, uh, our objective is to do the video recording and then our colleagues will uh, do some necessary cutting or uh, etc. to the video so that you can run smoothly. After that, we will email you the link for the proof version of the video. And then mm -hmm. you, uh, after you approve it, then we will release it to our ordinary members and also and then to the public as a free open access video series. And for our co-chair, do you have uh, any uh, a further uh, a question or uh, idea to talk with Professor Hobby? Yeah, if not, then this is our great honor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, Thank I will you. email you. Yeah, in fact, I mean, one of our co chair, Professor Greg Donners, uh, originally would like to attend uh, and chair this session also as well. But because he is now in US, he, he and he has some, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. he is also the same as you. He graduated from Yale University, yeah. Also but computer I, science. I have I have one question. Yes, uh, I have one question from professor, sir. Yes. What What do you think that uh, AI will reduce the job for a professor or teachers, or it will enhance his research capability? Whether it's that a is threat a, for the job market. <laughs> that is a really interesting question because, of course, many people feel it is a threat. And I think it is both a threat and a help. It is a threat for the lazy guy who wants to do the easy work because it can do the easy work. But if you think, hmm, now I must make my question to my student much more clever. I say to my student, 
make some do something and give me the the piece of software or give me the the summary or give me the history or give me the essay he will do that straight and that's easy from gpt right but if i say to him okay that was step one now take your essay and make him more more clever change him with a different perspective do something show the contrast between one time and another time change the code to do something now try again that was step two now the student must say oh maybe i can try again with chat gpt but i must do some more work and i say okay i've got step two now step three make him more complex put something else on top give me the historical perspective change him make the software if the if the professor is clever to make the questions more and more complex in a sequence at some point the student will say I cannot use chat anymore. Chat is too simple. I must take what chat can give me and make my own answer on top. So the student is learning how to use chat, how to understand where chat is too small, how to fix chat with his own knowledge. And that is the better student, right? But it means more work. The professor has to do more work to think more intelligent questions. So the good professor will be happy. He will be great. He'll use chat and he will make good questions. He will use chat to make his own questions. So his work will be easier at the top. But the lazy professor who just says, ah, here's a simple question answer, his work will go away because the student can cheat him. That's what I think is going to happen. Yeah. It's interesting, right? It's an interesting yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we yeah, should be yeah. careful. We should be careful. Now <laughs> many universities are considering <laughs> how to handle this year. I know they have, it's they... a very you should see all people here we, the university is running up and down everybody's scared yeah oh uh, yeah 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 because professor Chai, yeah especially he is concerned with this problem because he is a former principal in a india you yeah in a university in india yeah so yeah. he yeah. yeah he think about how to maybe do regulation about how to use chat cdp in his university yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah everybody is scared the government also yeah. i tell you the companies are scared they say this thing is eating my job i say it's not eating your job you can take 10 programmers now chat gpt does the simple program but it's not quite correct you take your 10 programs they must quickly use chat gpt now they must fix chat gpt then they must do more they will do more work for you but the bad programmer, I'm sorry, you have to fire him because he cannot do better than chat. But the good programmer, he can stand on top of chat and he can do more. So it's again, it's a differentiation. Yeah, yeah. interesting. We, we have to do well, yeah. much more value add to, to the work. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think that's what's yeah. going to happen. And yeah. in that sense, it is good to our, to our society because we can produce more out of more the existing work. We can become, you know, we can have a much better efficient system we can build up by using our own mind. Yes, yeah, I, yeah. but it is easy. Of course, we are all intelligent people, right? So for us, okay. it is easy. We are on the top. We feel confident. I worry. Mm. I'm sad for the non-intelligent person because his job, they, the machine will eat his job. And so he has to, we have to, in society, we must find a job like a nursing or painting the graffiti or make the street something that those people can go do otherwise otherwise there's problem in society right if we make a better technology to help at the top we have to do something to help in the bottom if that's the society as a whole it may become a political problem as well because yes. for the politician yeah. they will yeah. need to decide how to do the taxation for the so that i mean so that we we distribute the in the income so that for those who cannot work so long or whose job are lost, they will get, I mean, something from the government, yeah, because yes. or to, yeah, or yeah. how to we educate them or we I mean so that they can gain the knowledge in other area. That's yeah. still yeah, I will have good employment op opportunity. Yeah, that is a, a even a topic for politics. No, not it's only for us to... as a scientist. Yeah. Yeah. We must, not we are, as a scientist, we have a responsibility not to to mess the society. So we mm. can build a tool like ChatGPT is a good thing, yeah. but we must also understand that ChatGPT will never be a nice nurse. When my when I'm sad and I'm crying, I want somebody to hold me warm and nice, right? My children. 
And that's only a human can do that. So we have to find carefully which job is, and we must reward those jobs equally. That's, I think, important for us, even society, scientists, to talk mm -hmm. to the politician, to say, hey, politician, I yeah. use my mind to make a tool for you, but you must mm -hmm. use your mind to make society stable and happy. Yeah, we can tell them, I mean, well, yeah. well, what is, but they will have their uh, concern and also their political idea because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, so. not, not uh, yesterday, our two, I mean, our Norway also all talk a lot about the uh, chat GDP and also the benefit and also the, especially the worry and yeah. of the advance of the AI technology and how we can. I mean, handle that at once so that it will become good to our society as a whole. Yeah, a very interesting, but also very tough, I mean, topic. Lot of, yeah. uh, yes, yeah. lot of scientists and also politics are also involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is our great honor. Thank you. Let's Thank end you our very much. again. And so we will proceed with our invite talk. Okay. Thank you and goodbye, Thank you. everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So.